Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Richard Lee Stout. I'm a partner with RPI. Uh, I've been uh, hanging with this crew since about 2004. Um, I was the um, I was the most technical person of a functional consulting team until we finally got Carl. So, uh, so Carl, <laughs> our official yeah. and, uh, uh, number one uh, what's your transition consultant hire. That <laughs> segue. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, hi. So my name is Carl C. Uh, I'm a tech lead, tech lead here at RPI. Started here in about 2013. Um, came on with a big version 10 wave. Uh, so did that for a few years. Um, now I've been working on the multi-tenant implementations and learning all the, that stuff. All right. How about Jeremy? Uh, sure. My name is Jeremy Stoltzfus. Uh, been with RPI since the beginning of 2017, so uh, a few years now. And um, yeah, like Carl, I haven't done as many version 10 upgrades as he has. He's probably the champion in the number of ones completed, but I've um, been working with Lawson for over 15 years and now uh, a lot of focus on the multi-tenant uh, cloud implementations as well. All right, Chip. I'm Chip Cunningham, uh, senior technical consultant here at RPI. I've been working in the Lawson space since about 2003 um, and working at RPI for about five years. Um, and I've done 10 upgrades um, and as well as uh, multi-tenant implementations, GHR implementations. And Tom? Tom Severson here. So I started my uh, Lawson career actually with Lawson Software back in 1997. So I'm, I'm one of the old guys here. I've uh, been with RPI for a little over a year now and really kind of in the realm of multi-tenant implementations myself. Great. And I'm uh, Ken Foley. I um, am the practice manager uh, for the InfoTech services and uh, managed services. I've uh, been with RPI for a little over a year. Um, been in the space since the late 90s. All right. So, Mr. Drexel, do we have any topics so far? And if we don't, then Chip, I'm going to ask you to feed us one. Oh, here we go. Any t okay, so we got a question here. Any tips or tricks for setting up the Ion Enterprise Connector to the Infor Data Lake? No takers? Tips or tricks? <laughs> um, my recommendation would be to call Aaron Epps and Bo Hunt because they're, they're the two foremost experts on how to do that. Yep. So Daniel, just so you know, we do have sessions, because Daniel's the one who asked the question. We do have some uh, sessions for Burst, the Cloud Suite show and tells. Um, they're on the hour, one, two, three, and four, and that's where Aaron will be. So you could certainly pose the question there or connect with them. So okay. I have an enterprise connector to the data lady. I, I would guess the use case there is you have uh, maybe an on-premise system or a non-enforced system that you want to uh, take data from and, and push that into the lake, uh, maybe because you want to do some burst reporting that combines uh, Cloud Suite data with data from this other system. Um, so that would be a pretty exciting use case. Yeah, I think, I think yeah, okay, an on-prem SQL server to, to, yeah, with mm -hmm. clinical data. Yeah, I, I think Aaron's the best resource on that. Um, I, I I personally don't know how to do it, but I've seen uh, I've seen him set that stuff up um, before. It's not uh, the most straightforward, and I don't think that there is a how-to guide uh, in the import docs. Um, so, if I find out from him in the meantime, I'll let you know. Let's take the next question. Okay. Hey, John. Welcome. How's it going? We got a t question here from Dan. Um, says, I need to refresh an in-house reporting database. If I need a small amount of data, would it be more efficient to use INAPI API gateway versus replication sets? 
That's from right. Dan. Not sure about more efficient. I think it depends on where you want to trigger it from. So with replication sets, you'd be triggering it from the landmark multi-tenant side, where on with Ion API Gateway, you could trigger it from your uh, replication database. I think it just depends on how often you want to trigger it and where you want to trigger it from. Looks like we have another question that came in from um, John. So we have a so we have a Hadoop data lake on prem. Our database folks want an N4 data shipped to the on prem data lake. Can N4 send all the data? So yeah, I mean, uh, I'll take this one. It, yes, uh, I'm working with a client who's doing something very similar actually, and they're taking the pretty much the entire GHR uh, database um, and building that all out with replication sets. What they are running into is that it, it takes a long time for all those replication sets to process. So it, um, it really kind of just depends on how often you need that to be refreshed and what, uh, you know, what type of uh, timing you're looking at with, with replicating all that. And Jeremy, I heard one of the challenges is if you replicate every field in every business class, uh, then every single monthly update is going to change, make at least some change, right? Like there'll definitely be one field uh, in the schema that's impacted, uh, and that means you're, uh, you know, on the receiving side, it's going to be receiving data in a different schema than it did the previous month. Yep, absolutely. So there could be an extension to a field. A field may grow in length or new fields added um, infrequently, but sometimes happens. Fields will be taken away as well. So is there a middle ground? I mean, rather than replicating every business class and every field, how do you approach that, uh, you know, and still get close to that objective of basically saying all of my key business data is 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 available in my in my data warehouse uh yeah I, I i think the middle ground is like determining your your frequency of of how often that data in your data warehouse on-premise data warehouse needs to be refreshed um if it's if it's primarily for metrics and, and analytical data, then, you know, once a week may be sufficient. Um, and then you can have more time to troubleshoot as a monthly CU comes out. Uh, you have, it gives you a little bit more leeway time. If you're looking for real-time transactional reporting, it's probably not going to be your best solution. Yeah. Looks like we have another question here from Jesse. So any tips for how to query all the data using LPL to see if a particular record exists or a particular field changed? Uh, for example, active visit, active position flag flipped. Not sure about LPL or, or what kind of context you would be using the LPL for, like a user field. Um, that sounds more like a replication set, though. That's kind of one of the things they do is identifying f uh, changes in fields values. Uh, Glenn asked a question here. I'm not sure. He says, do we have a reference for the amount of data and amount of time just for ballpark? I'm not sure what question that's in reference to, Glenn. Um, if that's in reference to the info pushing all data to, yeah, data, data lake. Um, yep. So the, the client that I was working with was a healthcare system with about 7,000 employees. Um, uh, and I can't remember the specifics around it, but I know it was taking several, several hours to push all that data down. And then um, I wasn't I wasn't involved with the processing on the client side on their their internal data lake. And then one thing that we did discover with that then too is all that's being pushed down. Um, those processes are running in async, so you got to think about what that's doing to your async queues in your cloud environment and what um, 
processes that may be running that are going to be delayed because your async threads are all consumed. Any... Oh, one more question here. Has anyone, has anyone changed their UPN from in logins to email logins? And if yes, have you encountered any issues with doing so? Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a, that makes a great poll. Uh, hey, if anybody out there is watching, um, have made this change. Shout out in the, uh, shout out in the chat. Carl, didn't you just do this at uh, San Gabriel, or where you changed that bod, ion bod? What is an ion login? No phone. I thought you fixed the you you did that in Ion where you started using the email instead of the UPN. Employee number login. Hmm. Sorry, I'm not following the context. Oh, I think uh, when they're I mean, logging in. Yeah, I think. What are they think using for the login? Yeah. So. Um, haven't changed the UPN. We left the UPN as is, but we had ADFS configured that the um, this is for one client where they had they they could type their network name in, and then if the way their ADFS server was configured, it automatically put the domain backslash in front of it, um, so that they could do that. So you can log in with the domain backslash and then your network login or the email address. We found that to work. That's come up when we've had to do account consolidation, right? For an organization that used to have a separate ESS login from a core login, and then that needs to be consolidated. So it's changed to just be like an email address. Right. Yeah, that UPN value on the AD is the kind of the key, pretty much the key to everything. So. Um, so with the ADFS trust, we have kind of configured um, different key values there, uh, like Windows account name versus UPN. Uh, I think Shane used some kind of weird value. Um, so you can do different uh, key drivers there on the ADFS setup with Blossom, um, but you're somewhat limited as far as with the uh, uh, it being a valid claim type within ADFS. Um, that's the key, kind of key driver there. You got to have that schema for the claim type. Oh, uh, yes. So we have done that. Um, so the default loss out of the box is Windows account name, where you do domain backslash user. Um, we've changed it to be UPN for the at domain.com format. Sorry, it's a little slower there. I don't have any other questions right now. Um, yeah, if you guys want to talk about some of your topics, and then we can come back to questions later if we get more. Uh, looks like, Chip, you're first on the list here. Oh, yay. <laughs> Can take us away? So um, one, of, one of the things that I've been doing a lot of lately is uh, integrating Cloud Suite with... Uh, different applications um, inside the, you know, inside the multi-tenant world, for example, EAM to, um, to Cloud Suite for assets and POs and stuff like that. And, um, you know, as we, as we start to do that, we're starting to um, kind of, I guess, feel the, the power and ability of ION to work as an integration engine um, and having to make changes in the mapping using X, XSLT um, because, uh, you know, like with any integration, they, they give it, you know, they give you the integration, but it's only about, you know, it's 90%. So um, is there anybody there that's doing those integrations with uh, other Infor products using um, ION? Um, and, and what are your challenges and issues with it? I 
Just... Okay. And you've been learning XSL, a nice 20 year old technology that's made it yeah. in ion. Yeah. Exciting. Yeah. It occurred to me um, just the other day that, like, I, I, mean, I told you that I had some experience with XSL back when I was a web developer. Um, I think I also had experience with bots then. It's just we didn't call it that. So I had, to, uh, I, had I had a website, um, a fancy basketball uh, website, and we uh, the 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 data feed that we had from the NBA came over in a format called Sports ML, and we'd basically get an XML document. So at the conclusion of a, of an NBA game, we get an XML document where like the top element is. Uh, you know where did where did what arena did the game take place in? You know what was the what was the time of the game? And under that, we had uh, an element for each team that played, and then under each team's element, we had you know uh, eight or twelve uh, individual player elements, then with attributes for uh, you know points, assists, rebounds, steals, blocks, and what have you. And that came over as a unit, basically. You'd get the entire XML document representing the whole game in sports all format. Uh, and then we used XSL to translate that into um, uh, both into um, a format that, that we could persist in SQL Server. And then we also use XSL to rewrite it into um, HTML, nice table formatting and everything. And uh, I, it's funny, because it's like, I think that's pretty much exactly what Ion does. Except with Ion, it might take like a purchase order. We see like the purchase order, you know, header with like the date and the name of the buyer, what have you, might be the top element. And then under that, you might have elements for every purchase order line. Uh, and then within there, you know, item detail or um, GL distributions or what have you. Uh, and then that can come into Ion. Uh, you can subscribe to that in Ion and then use XSL to take that pod and mm -hmm. rewrite it into you know a CSV format or something that would fit into a database or you know whatever your receiving application needs to see that in. Yeah, and that's kind of what we're doing there, uh, doing a, a client I'm working with is, um, you know, the, the BODs coming from CSF kind of match what EAM needs. Um, their EAM system is live right now, so they've got a bunch of purchase orders in there and we're having to use XSL to transform and get those purchase order numbers in the right format so that they can be accepted by EAM, um, and using you know, using that that mapping tool has been it's actually been it's been pretty easy. Um, my learning curve for XSLT is slowly going up, but um, it's it's a you know when you're talking about EAM already being operational and you have to pull purchase orders, historical purchase orders in, and those purchase orders can change because they're open and you need to set that connection up. And that, that's basically what we've been doing. Looks like John B's got a question about print shares and multi-tenant. Yeah, John's asking, uh, how do we do print shares and multi-tenant? And we are a window shop and everyone has direct access to their print folder. So within multi-tenant, when you're running a report, it goes into your My Print Files location, and that's just something that you can access uh, directly from, from the web environment. From there, you can open them up, and um, if it's a CSV file or whatever it is, you just open it up and can print to your local uh, Windows printer at that point. Or if it's a CSV file, you can download it directly um, and save it to your desktop. Because yeah, in general, a cloud suite, you don't see, you know, running a, a print job and then it having the server push that out to a printer directly, right? It's it's more like a person is opening something on screen and then just, you know, going into Adobe and hitting print or whatever. Correct. Uh, one exception would be um, mobile supply chain. Um, so you there is a... Um, there's a, uh, a printer agent that you install on a workstation, and then that printer agent is configured to connect to a, a, um, a quote printer in your mobile supply chain setup, and then it basically monitors that print queue and then 
will send things to the printer as they're detected. Yeah, that's a, where a workflow is totally driven by a piece of paper showing up. Yes. Yeah. Looks like we have another question for Carl. Um, it says, Carl, if we change the UPN, do MSCM handhelds work on the new UPN? Uh, so the MSTM handhelds go through the LDAP bind port. So that would use um, whatever uh, whatever you have set up for the LDAP bind. That can be SAM account name or UPN. The default is UPN though. And uh, LBI and MSTM can, can go through N4OS. Um, I believe there's uh, plugins that you can default it to, but you can just add any site in 4OS. And the single sign-on should work since it's going through LSF and ADFS. Okay, no more questions. Anyone else have any questions for us? Drop it in the chat. Or, you know, any comments on these questions? So. Mm -hmm. If it's something that you've actually tried out, had experience with, we'd love to hear about it. Looks like in the meantime, Tom wants to talk about data refreshes between multi-tenant environments. <laughs> sure. So a lot of my world right now, I'm doing uh, multiple multi-cloud uh, implement or multi-tenant implementations. Um, a lot of time is spent doing data refreshes. So you're going to do that during the implementation phase for sure, but you're also going to do it post go live um, to refresh your test and development environments and whatnot. Um, kind of some tips and tricks that we've learned along the way in these data refreshes is first knowing what uh, stack your environments are in. So N4 has two different uh, stacks. There's a production stack, which gets patches pretty much every month, mid-month. There's also a pre-production stack, which uh, they get their patches done at the beginning of the month. So the pre-production first, and then two weeks later, you've got your production uh, patch patches that are applied. Why that's important is any type of data refresh, your environments have to be at the same level. So if you are if you're crossing the barrier between the different stacks, that's going to have to be done after the production patch application. So that's going to be in the, in the back half of the month that you have to schedule those. Um, in order to do a refresh, you need to open up a ticket with N4, and they basically are two weeks out. So you, when you're scheduling these, it's a minimum of two weeks before they can't request, hey, can you do this next or this weekend or next Monday? Uh, it has to be two weeks out. When you're going through your, you specify your source and your target. The target is going to be overwritten, so it's critical that you export any of your uh, config console changes, your uh, PFI workflow data, you need to export all of that uh, prior to the data refresh or those are going to be blown away. Um, so once the once the refresh happens, of course, then you import all those changes back in and the configuration changes that they're there. And the next kind of trick that we've we've learned the hard way several times is Typically during a refresh, your target async queues are going to have some issues. So it's critical, you know, once once you've got notification that the uh, that the refresh is complete, to go into those async queues, look for any failed triggers and resubmit those triggers. Otherwise, your queues are just going to be stuck queuing everything up because they're they're stuck from the refresh. So pretty critical to um, as soon as you've got the notification, go into the async queues and resubmit any of those failed triggers. So just little lessons that we've learned uh, along the way. But you're going to be doing lots of uh, lots of refreshes between tenants in, in the multi-tenant environment. Just to add to that, um, when Infor does a refresh, if you're running both HCM and FSM, they generally would want to do both product lines at the same time. Um, there can be exceptions to that made sometimes. So just um, I've had to basically just convince them that it's during an implementation and I don't need FSM or I don't need HCM. Um, so uh, just be aware of that as well, that, that they're going to do both HCM and FSM when you request a data refresh. Yeah, and the tickets that I've been doing recently, they've made me specify which suites as well, whether it's FSM, HCM, or, uh, and or MSCM. But they do like to keep everything in sync together. Well, if you just do one side and not the other, do you ever have a problem where the links between the two 
break. I mean, like, uh, you know, uh, buyers uh, in procurement that are tied back to resources on the HCM side. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's the concern there, right? Yeah. Why they want what do you do? You just like go in, uh, that, like share processes, employee info, whatever, and right click and like fix everyone by hand. Yeah, so if that, that data is not there, um, the times that I've requested it to be separately is because I knew that the source, and again, during implementation more than a, a post go live event, right? Because I knew that my source, um, different timelines for the HCM project versus the FSM project. So wanting to move data from one environment to the other to support um, multiple test environments, different testing environments, and being able to do that. So you do have to be careful and aware of, uh, of your employee records that are used on the finance side. We did have a few more questions come in here. Um, Glenn's asking, he says, I assume security can be customized in a multi-tenant environment. We have a request that only a few people can see senior management HR data. Is this possible? Uh, yeah, I'll take that one. That, yes, it's you can definitely customize um, security and multi-tenant environments, you customize it the same same way you customize security in a single tenant environment. You make copies of the roles um, and, and create new roles and add security classes to them. So, and, and um, your, you know, the specific question you asked about is also definitely possible. Um, you just have to have some kind of a data field or some kind of a HR organization to queue off of for the security. And we have another question here from Daniel. Daniel's asking, what's the best way to handle scheduled outbound jobs during data refreshes, i.e. outbound EDI jobs that we wouldn't want to go from TST? Up from this point, I've had to go in and delete all action requests manually. Uh, there is definitely some amount of work you have to do after a data refresh to with configuration um, sets and, and jobs that are, are in process, but uh, um, I don't know of any other way to do it besides manually going and canceling them. Yeah, and that's going to be the same for like scheduled process flows as well. They're all going to um, be copied over uh, in any scheduled action. Like that. No more questions right now. Any of our panelists want to take a stab at? Talking us through something. Um, I am curious if if anyone has implemented N4 OS as STS or the user bonds on premise yet. If you have any thoughts or questions around that, we've started doing that recently for some on premise clients, and it's actually really smooth. Um, seems easier to set up than ADFS personally. Um, pretty impressed with how that's going so far. Uh, we just have another question come in from Jesse. Jesse says, what's your favorite recent LPL trick or discovery? I will take this opportunity to promote the next session uh, that Jackie Dudas and I are doing uh, on cool configurations. But uh, definitely have done a lot of work in the TA realm and um, uh, in the HR side with uh, configurations. Um, Key takeaway, uh, just a spoiler alert, key takeaway, derived fields and user relations can be pretty powerful. I think as we um, get deeper into these HCM implementations, we found a few instances where the user business class actually makes sense. Finally, it's been there for several years. Um, but for a while, we kind of had a struggle of figuring out where that actually made sense. Um, but, but getting that in there where, where something that's truly needs its own business class and separate data and being able to do the relations to other business classes, like tying it to the employee business class, um, works pretty cool for having that tie in, that uh, automatic relation, being able to do the forms and list. Um, it's worked out pretty neat. Yeah, I'll tag on to what Jeremy said. Derived fields, I mean, 
Derived fields basically give you a way to write your own LPL program, really. You can do if statements, for loops, while loops. Um, so derived fields are pretty powerful. Oh, thanks, Tree, for bringing that up. Um, yeah, we recently saw that uh, Mingle 11 is coming up on um, end of life early next year, uh, at least for on premise. So um, I think, I, I, I don't know about you guys, I feel like it's maybe half and half or maybe less than half and half adoption of uh, Mingle 12 or, or Info OS or on prem, right? So we're probably going to see this impact. So a pretty good number of people that still need to keep Lawson live in the 2021 and and beyond. And um, you know, for uh, for any organization that has not done ADFS yet, uh, what do you guys think? Is it better to just let's say you you you've not done ADFS, you're the, the old school uh, LF XTS whatever Mingle 11, and now you're going to go to Mingle 12. Which is like a server replacement, right? It's not. It's not an upgrade. It's. It's. You're going to build a new Mingle box, um, new new Windows server. Um, do you do you do ADFS as the first jump, or do you skip ADFS altogether, or the traditional ADFS setup where you have to like modify every Lawson system and just go right to N4 OS? That is an honest question. I don't know. Yeah, sure. Trying to get a conversation started. I think it's a good plug to um to do N4 and, and ADFS. Sorry, N4 OS and ADFS together. Um, you're going to be setting up N4 OS on a new server anyway. So, like in your production environment for a go live, you can go ahead and get that all installed, configured with ADFS. Um, there's quite a bit of work there uh, before you go into the go live of actually flipping. <laughs> and landmark over to ADFS. And if you're not there yet, I think it's worth looking into the N4 STS so you can use the, the user bonds to keep all three in sync. Um, that will keep your users and roles in sync between N4 OS Mingle, Landmark, and LSF um, all at mm -hmm. the same time. Uh, right, so I think just to clarify, hopefully I'm saying this correctly. So Mingle 12, Mingle 12, you, you've got to either have ADFS or N4 OS as STS. And those are the two possible authentication schemes that Mingle 12 supports, right? Yes. But if you if you use N4 OS as STS, you still have to have some other kind of identity manager. It will set like a LDAP bind, but um, typically you can still plug it into it. <coughs> Right. So it's still ADFS is still in play. It's just the idea is mingle or, or in for OS is that bridge to ADFS and then like LSF and landmark and whatever else you have is working against in for OS instead of directly configured for ADFS. Mm. Yeah. Does in for us open up yeah. other opportunities other than ADFS like Azure and other identity yes. providers? Yep. yep. It does not support Smart Office or Lawson Analytics, though, that configuration. Oh. Yeah, because um, it's it's not like a full uh, SAML 2.0 service, from what I heard. Currently on ADFS, so can you just upgrade Mingle to 12 and be all set? Yeah, I, I think so. Right, you just basically bring up the new Mingle server and then do a cutover, and that's, that's yep. it. Yeah, we have a good question from Bill here. Who left that left no, 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 come on. no, no, we, we don't need those. No, Honestly, just, can you um, actually talk to them from the session? <laughs> Thank <that> you. <laughs> we can, yeah. we can mute them. Uh, we do. Have, Question here: How many on-prem clients are you aware of implementing in for OS as STS? I, I don't know how many. It's it's rare, right? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm doing one. 
aware of how many RPI in general is doing. I think you might be it. I don't know who else here would be working on it. Yeah, I think one. I only know the one now. And it's going swimmingly, I hear, Carl? Uh, yeah, surprisingly very well. I think one thing I would say there is that it's, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a new thing for on permits. So I think one thing that we're saying is when we do run into an issue and have to open an enforce support ticket, it's basically going straight to a senior level resource. Um, kind of like all our new products. So like you're uh, implementing it new, um, you're getting exceptional and quick support. So that's been pretty nice. All right. Another question, not from Bill. Um, so <laughs> <other day. laughs> he learns quick. <laughs> Have there been any unique challenges with on-prem? That sounds like a Bill question. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Keeping it up to date? Yeah, that's the biggest challenge. Is, hmm. Yeah. I mean, we've got, we got a client we're working with right now that um, uh, is, is going to Cloud Suite. And even though they're leaving Lawson behind, it's, you know, a multi-year journey. Obviously, you know, pay payroll is a later phase. Um, so loss and payroll on-prem is still gonna be a production system for like mm -hmm. two years. Um, and with a, you know, with a three-year-old, with only three years old uh, loss and system, uh, where there's still some challenges in, um, you know, the, 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 some of the, the integration and conversion features we want to use um, sort of rely on, on newer updates on the environment side. And uh, mm. it, it, it becomes hard to juggle, you know, running through a, a major environmental environment update on-prem and asking people to test, take time out of their day to deal with that upgrade as well as participate in a, in a cloud suite project too. So. You know, I guess um, that's that's probably the biggest challenge that I'm seeing from on-prem customers is simply um, staying ahead of the curve enough to not uh, not end up in a situation where like, oh, I really want to be able to do X, but I would need to do you know this upgrade that has this prerequisite that requires this new server uh, to to do so. I think personally, it's been uh, Windows 2016 for the on-premise. So yeah, that should be interesting because um, we, you no, know, as of today, uh, LSF it's not supported on 2016, right? Right. And we have Mark. Uh, we have also. an end of life um, for Windows 2012 R2 uh, coming up in was it in uh, October 2023? Yeah. So. Three years, right? One, two, mm -hmm. yeah, three years. Yep. So we know N4OS can be on 2016. Obviously, if they're you know using ADFS, that's 2016. But I think other components are 2012 R2. Yeah. As of right now. And we saw that uh, we saw there's a, a browser change, a change in browser support coming up this year. Mm -hmm. as well, right? So IE 11 mm -hmm. will no longer uh, be supported. Now, I mean, it, we expect it'll keep working, right? Like if you if you have a two or three year old loss in environment, there's no reason why IE 11 would just stop working. Um, but where, uh, you know, an on-prem system, you have pretty much control over what's getting updated uh, over on the desktop and browser side, uh, you know, you have a lot less control there um, if, if Microsoft tells you, hey, there's some critical vulnerability in IE 11, by the way, we don't support that browser either, and you should be using the new Edge, um, there's not, not too much you can do about that completely mm -hmm. in a tough spot. Uh, yeah. Is anybody out there using uh, Edge, um, Edge Chromium? Ha had success with it in, in the enterprise? I mean, I use it on, on my, my computer. I mean, obviously, we're a small company. We don't have... Uh, you know, the, a typical enterprise deployment, uh, the, the workstations and stuff. I've used, been using it on my desktop, and it seems like a lot like regular Chrome, 
uh, but it works better with Office 365, as far as I can say. Hmm. Okay. We have another question here. Yeah, go ahead, John. What is, of, what is the risk in implementing FSM Finance MT before HCM GHR MT? Oh, that's a great question. So, uh, okay, let me start by asking this. If if you were to implement Cloud Suite Finance, this goes back to what I asked you before. If you implement Cloud Suite Financials and Supply Management, and we know that you need a GHR shell for that to work, right? Like there, you, certain roles within the finance and supply side, you need an HR resource for. So at that point, GHR is like production once you're live on FSM, even though it might only have you know, 40 or 50 employees in it. How do you handle data conversion in, on, uh, as part of an HCM project uh, when GHR is technically a live, live system? Again, honest question. I don't know the answer. Yeah, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a big risk. Because there are people that are, that there, there are people in this session that are gonna be facing that, right? It's, they're, they're, uh, there have been uh, FSM projects that have launched uh, first uh, as a precursor to the HCM side, particularly those organizations that are driven by a big GL redesign, right? Where like they, I, I, they're, they're doing a major GL redesign, wanna get that done first and then start looking at their HR structure after they've gone through the GL exercise? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough question because, you know, once you have those employees in there, that, that changes a lot of stuff with the, uh, you know, the way that the, um, the dates are set up. Um, and uh, I'm, I would almost be for creating a shell, but then once you create a shell, you can't, it's hard to go back and, and use the import process for those employee imports for the conversions um, because the import process creates employees. It doesn't update employees. So what we've done is we've actually created process flows and process automations that go and do that. Um, at least this is how I've done it. it go and do that uh, conversion rather than using the import tools, but then you run up against issues with that because of performance. And sometimes it can take longer to run a process automation against that. Um, so I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts, but that's that's kind of what we did when we had employee history or writing over employees on a couple of the projects I've been on. Yeah, Jean points out the employee effective date is key. Yeah, the effective date. And once you have an employee effective date in there, you can't go beyond it. And it's got to be accurate because your effective date is also usually around your higher date. So. We have another question from Glenn here. It says, do you have a recommendation recommendation of which modules to go to the Cloud Suite first? Finance, SCM, HR, payroll, looking to go there in the next few, few years. And Glenn also says they're on-prem for all of those modules. Yeah, well, first let me state that um, you, got, you got some dependencies there. So finance and supply move together as a unit. Um, it's it's not really feasible to do finance and, and supply on separate uh, timelines. Um, and then, you know, HR, as we were just discussing, HR can go uh, before or after, uh, but there are some unique conversion challenges to doing uh, HR after. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, when HR goes first, one of the challenges is uh, the, the, the GL shell within HR, uh, I think we've, I think the consensus is it pretty much needs to stay the lock on GL, even once you're live on Cloud Suite Financials until payroll moves. And then um, obviously HR is a prerequisite to payroll. Um, and I think theoretically you could do HR and payroll simultaneously, or you could do HR first and payroll second. So it's just a general recommendation. I'm gonna go with HR followed by finance and supply chain 
followed by payroll. But you know, every situation is unique. You got to look at the drivers of why why are you going into this project. I'd second that order. Third. <laughs> cool. That's also the order in which those softwares were released. So you're implementing the oldest software first, which I think makes a lot of sense. Don't want to be the first organization using some particular feature functionality in, in, a, in, a, in a software. I got a question from Dan here. It says, is it possible to create custom reports in LPL, like a modified version of the AP check register? Or should all report developments be on burst or offline from a reporting database? So I'll take this one. Um, Sort of. Uh, I'm not sure what the AP check register looks like specifically, but um, again, this goes back to um, being able to build out derived fields and how you can put them in. Because if you're, report, you're building a report um, within the application, you're going to be building it off of a list view. Um, so if you can, and when you're building that off of a list view, you're starting with, you have to start with a business class. So somehow, if there's data that's collected from other business classes, you have to um, build those derived fields. And this is where, you know, like we mentioned earlier, with uh, derived fields, you can write a lot of uh, loop logic, if-then logic, to, to consolidate um, a, a lot of that information. I was recently working on a benefits uh, census report that um, it's one line per employee, but then across the, across the top is the various benefit plans. And then it shows which plan option they've rolled in, their coverage level and dollar amount. And that was all done um, using a, a couple of custom relationships and um, uh, derived fields. Yeah, it really kind of depends on the complexity. Um, how, how complex is the report going to be? Um, there, there's a lot of functionality that you can use in LPL to create derived fields and reports and stuff like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, what kind of calculations are you trying to do, and um, you know how um, how difficult is it to do it in LPL as opposed to dumping it into SQL into it and doing it in a database? Is there um, is there a possibility of like cloning a built-in report or or configuring a built-in report so that way at least you haven't totally branched off from the info report in case the application gets updated, you, you want to still be able to take advantage of that? Yeah, you can start with a list report. You can copy that list report over to a new, another report, but yes. Yeah. I think reporting has been a little bit of a challenge in Cloud Suite financials right now. I know we have a lot of sessions around Burst, but I think what, we, what I've been seeing is kind of three different things. So. You know, you, any lists in Classic Financials you can make a report out of. So we end up with uh, list-based reports within financials. Uh, some of the N4 BI reports are still delivered out of the box, um, like the GL trial balance, I think. So we're using reports in BI, and then some of the newer burst functionality. Um, that's some of the newer reports there. Um, but not all of it has been delivered in N4 BI. So we kind of end up with three different reporting structures. but um, you know, we've been going with, uh, you know, what's delivered out of the box. What's the, what makes the most sense to, to create that report in? Yeah. Any organization, you're going to be starting with whatever they give you and, and, and changing it. That, and that's always the, the challenge is like, yeah, it's 85% of what you need in the report, but there's going to be some work, whether it's burst, whether it's in four BI or whether it's uh, list views to get it to that 100%. But I, I think um, when I, you know, one of the clients that I'm working with, they, they like the burst reports, but they're not there. So we're, we're making modifications to them, to, especially on the financial side. John asks, what challenges have you seen in the new PR module? Have you guys seen the new PR model? Yeah, it's not there. I haven't seen it, so that's the biggest challenge. Yeah. I, don't, I don't really know anything about so, it. We, um, at, at 3 o'clock Eastern, uh, 
Ariani and Monica are um, are going to are going to actually live demo um, some parts of the the new uh, version 11 payroll, and then at four o'clock Eastern, uh, Dan Bruding and Melissa Olson are going to present on sort of the current state of payroll. Um, we are uh, we, one of our Cloud Suite projects um, is I don't know if early adopter is the right phase, but um, we're going to be implementing um, payroll. So we have that going on um, right now. They're not live yet. Um, this is a, a technical roundtable, and it sounds like, from a technical perspective, I don't, I don't think that we have faced a lot of challenges yet. I don't think we've had to get too involved yet. But our our payroll functional consultants have definitely been in the weeds. Um, yeah. That, uh that new payroll is is my project, and from a technical standpoint, really there haven't been a whole lot of uh, there haven't been a whole lot of issues. The the majority of the issues we've we've got some incidents open with Infor and whatnot are more functional facing than us. Uh, probably the biggest challenge is the newness of it. Um, so really, kind of learning the new features and functionality within the new payroll system. But from a technical standpoint, no, there really haven't been uh, there really haven't been any issues. Just a few more minutes here. Matthew has a question here. It says, what is the latest technology we need to bring onto our support teams, i.e. zip file, XML, web calls? What skills are new that we need to bring in? And um, Daniel replied and said, API calls would be a good one to know. Yeah, I think depending on what application you have in the cloud, um, especially if you have EAM or XM or like additional applications, um, getting to know Ion pretty well, so that's like the XML structure and like uh, Stout was saying earlier, the XSLT. Um, it's a good one to know to be able to do those mappings within Ion. That's very helpful. Um, definitely with the API calls, I think that's one of the coolest features to be able to do those REST SOAP calls. And really, that can be almost any language that you're used to, like Java.net or we were messing around with the um, Google Go. Um, I guess Java or .NET would be the biggest ones. Yeah. yeah. No more COBOL. No more COBOL. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah. Thank goodness. And I heard on the roadmap um, they're going to move away from having those zip files, right? Like for the uh, Canada space. They've already moved moved away from it somewhat with the home pages and stuff like that. Those are all configurations now. But yeah, I, I assume that in due time there won't be any more zip files. And really, the zip files are JavaScript. JavaScript, yeah. So. 